I can take it, just tell them to come. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Occupy, yeah. Very good afternoon. Uh, I would request everyone to please take the chairs in the front. A uh, lot of chairs are empty in the front, so I request everybody to please come forward. Uh, especially our PG students, the faculty at the back.
Zoom to all of you and more welcome to our chief executive, Sri Srinivas Kupitsa, the esteemed guests on the dais, Dr. Beru Rubakar and Dr. Zenkit, and welcome the audience who are looking forward to listening to this academic feast. At the outset, please expect Accept my apologies for making you wait for a while. Thank you for that. Very briefly, Dr. Bedul Prabhakar is a very familiar figure on the campus. Needs no introduction. However, customarily, I take, a, I take this as my privilege and pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Bedul Prabhakar. Professor of Microbiology, Immunology, with a PhD from University of Pennsylvania, working presently even as Associate Chief for Research and Innovation in Chicago Medical School, University of Illinois. Law of research to his credit, constantly working on his areas of interest, which is autoimmune diseases and cancer biology, and other details of cancer pathogenesis. Professor Venkat, we are very happy to have you with us and agreeing to be with us to deliver a talk on this topic of innovation in artificial intelligence driving healthcare globally. Professor Venkat is a senior professor in the Engineering College at University of Illinois. He's also the Associate Dean of Research in the same engineering college. Presently, he is the director of GPI. GPI, which is an initiative of University of Illinois, massively funded by the state of Illinois, $500 million. And this is a project which Dr. Zekic is leading. And you will only know very soon because I'm going to be stating the audience for his capabilities. He's been an excellent teacher and awarded for the same 2015 University of Illinois. He's also been awarded as the University of Illinois Scholar Award in 2017. A lot of research papers to his credit. Four research papers for best paper awards in 2018. He has his as a PI or co-PI grants which he has received amounting to 18 million through more than half a dozen funding agencies and for obvious reasons looks like the funding agencies have him as their favorite. 18 million as a PI. He's going to talk on this very interesting topic and I think I wish to address this responsibility to you Professor Venkat. You're going to have this impressive talk for the youngsters because you're already into this and I think yours will be impactful for seniors like us to convert ourselves into getting convinced about the role of artificial intelligence in healthcare and which is in thing today. Over to you, the stage is yours.
basic introduction to the grand challenges that uh, uh, that we've started thinking about, uh, and uh, and then I will give you a, a sort of a tour of uh, the kind of innovations that are happening in the recovery model, and then I will come back and, and conclude about what we are still really doing in the first step phase. So. Thank you. 
care to team care, right? And then, um, and then uh, there is the government-funded uh, insurance that is called Medicare. That's a, that's one of the largest payers, probably the largest payer in the country, right? And so, uh, and, and and so we want to basically empower, give them a platform, and we empower, have them empower, each of them have their own sort of incentives, and I'll talk about that in the later half of the talk. And we want to we want a platform that will bring all of them together to collaborate and you know tackle these kind of issues. And uh, and the approach that we are taking is what we call an innovation engine. Or you know this is this is what EPI is. It is uh, meant to bring multiple stakeholders together to solve a grand a grand challenge problem. So I think you know I'm going to just talk about how this is structured, but this will become clear once. Once I present EPI, but at the very, very everything we believe in higher education is driven by research and innovation. So that is the, the the bedrock of it all, right? So we want to start with key, you know, research and innovation, right? And outcome, you know, principles, methods, publications, right? That's the kind of bread and butter of what we do in higher education. And we want to take that to the next level by looking at use-inspired, you know. Talking about by way of principles, methods is all uh, fundamental research, right? And then there are use-inspired research where we are looking at research in very specific contexts. And I saw a grand sample of it this afternoon uh, in many different use-inspired contexts, right? And that requires research too, but it's more applied and translational in nature, right? And so, and out of these, this research comes tools, benchmarks, data sets, right? You know, so all this is sort of the bedrock of innovation. And we want to continue doing that. And this is something that universities do day in and day out. So in some ways, um, we we have a huge medical, one of the largest medical schools in the country. Um, we have uh, very large engineering departments in both Urbana Champaign and, and Chicago. And so all this is already happening. Now what we want to do is to bring all this into what we call an innovation engine. And that would propel this into actual practical use case, you know, whether it is in clinical health innovation, whether it is in population health, community-based health, and policy, right, you know, let's not forget that, you know, we can innovate, you know, within the health systems, but unless there is a broader outreach to governments to, to kind of align incentives around uh, the solutions, right, you know, um, this, this will all not work. So, we want to do this by involving community organizations, hospital systems, the industry, startups, you know, the uh, pharma companies, and right? So we have to build this sort of an innovation ecosystem that brings it all together. And we also have to train the workforce that will serve this ecosystem. So this means the students like you um, that are uh, that are you know graduating out of the program from the medical school and you know nursing and dental school. Doing that workforce training and you know uh, doing you know civic engage civic engagement and policy outreach you know working with NGOs working with government organizations and working with international partners like you so I think you know DPI again has 18 partners I'll talk about that all over the globe so in some ways we are orchestrating this grand experiment to solve one of the biggest challenges of our time so uh, I think. Strategically, this is the kind of impact we want to have on the research front, right? We want to establish uh, the science of trustworthy artificial intelligence in healthcare, right? You know, so, in some ways, this involves looking at things through a user-inspired lens, and you know, developing you know the ideas, research, data sets, you know, the solutions, and then going back and you know and, and fixing the foundations, right? You know, this is kind of iterative, and then we want to kind of Build a coordinated uh, intellectual hub that would, you know, catalyze and coordinate the use of responsible AI in healthcare. Right, and then we want to do education and outreach, uh, creating the future workforce of uh, AI and integrated in healthcare, uh, upscale and rescale population. So that are uh, we're not just looking at the four-year you know, degree programs, whether it is engineering programs or, uh, or programs in medicine, but also uh, there are 
are other uh, vocational programs that we want to support, and I talk about that. Right? Uh, so, so we're a very large. So the healthcare is a very large industry. So there's plenty of opportunity to upskill and reskill people. You know, the pandemic just showed that uh, a lot of a lot of industries went flat, and the the, the, the more robust sectors like healthcare and IT and so on, they kind of were able to be robust to survive. You know, to to let people that are having jobs in that sector and allow for more people to come into the sector. So I think, you know, there is a lot of work to be done in um, upscaling and reskilling and uh, broadening participation, having more underrepresented people, um, you know, join uh, at, at the, 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 the workforce that is trained in AI. Uh, and uh, sort of growth awareness of, you know, uh, the use of AI in healthcare sector. We also want to do transfer. Through our network of uh, you know, industry partners and uh, we are about solutions to application going, uh, incubate new companies. Uh, I talked about one company that we incubated that made more than $100 million in the last one year. Uh, and uh, engaging companies in RD efforts uh, involving healthcare and AI. And finally, we also want to do you know, this socioeconomic and policy impact, right? engage with the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois. Our mission is economic development for the state of Illinois. Um, and we also want to kind of present the dangers of the use of irresponsible artificial means, right? So I think, um, but through appropriate policies, you know, whether it is about, um, you know, uh, this bias, discrimination, um, healthcare uh, for that, you know, underserved, and helping people through, you know, community options. So all this, you know, essentially, you know, we are asking, what are the scientific opportunities and you know products that we can develop, right? And that that's going to have an impact in the technology space, right? And then when whose quality of life can we empower, right? You know, the people, the, the everybody in the ecosystem in some ways, right? And what actions need to be taken in order to have these impacts more likely? And so we are thinking about this engine and how to bring all these stakeholders together. And so that gives you a segue into what you know. Discovery Partners Institute, because you know we have we are an organization that can support this kind of effort on day one, right? You know, and, um, and so uh, we can we have industry and government partnerships. We are well supported by the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois, uh, which has given us a, a fairly generous capital endowment of 500 million dollars and a piece of land. We have very unique workforce development programs. I will not talk about that much. Um, that's a different portfolio in DPI. And then uh, international partnerships. So, um, and uh, this eminent institution is one among the 18 international partners that we have. So, that, that gives a, a segue into uh, DPI, and I will talk about DPI. Uh, so, just to step back, you know, Chicago and Illinois have all the uh, right ingredients to foster a thriving tech sector. So it's a very uh, ready talent pool. There is lots of research and innovation. There are four R1 universities research, one heavily research intensive universities in Illinois. Uh, combined research expenditures of more than uh, more than three billion dollars, right? You know, not just a uh, R&D expenditures per year. Um, and a very dynamic urban setting. Uh, and so the University of Illinois and the state of Illinois recognized this opportunity and created the Discovery Partners Institute. Uh, and the goal of DPI is very simple, to propel Chicago and Illinois into a preeminent, inclusive tech center by 2030, right? uh, with an actual annual impact of about $2.8 billion. Right? So our goals are kind of audacious. Right? 7,000 plus students primed for tech uh, jobs in Illinois annually, and uh, 3,000 plus, and specifically, you know, individuals from underrepresented backgrounds entering the tech sector. Um, 200 million plus in R&D every year, uh, dozens of startups in corporate innovation centers, and uh, new businesses, um, startups from born from university research and project demand. Right? So that's our Board. Of course, we are just starting, you know, under the, uh, we are, we are, we just started around the pandemic, this is the beginning of the pandemic, so we have a long way to go, but, you know, we keep this, uh, we keep this thing healthy and positive. So we do, basically, it boils down to three things, uh, preparing people. 
people got in human tech jobs all the way from kids who were high school to uh, adults. And then we fund research, and this is the part that I lead in EPI, uh, fund applied R&D research to expand the research base in Iran. And then finally, we create an ecosystem for business building based on university research. And so uh, I will mostly talk about the research, but uh, I'll give a quick sketch of the ecosystem we are building. But before that, I will talk about the workforce development program, the talent programs in a very, uh, in a nutshell way. So we, we have uh, a teacher training program that's aiming to uh, train about a thousand teachers uh, per year. And, uh, you know, about 20 to uh, 50 uh, high school students every year. And then we are also connecting into the community colleges that are offering two year programs uh, and uh, offering them uh, additional, you know, coursework and training. And then we have co op programs at DPI where students can work in a company and take classes at the same time. And so there are many companies just within uh, two miles of, you know, DPI. Thousand plus companies, and so students spend uh, a semester in DPI taking, you know, uh, classes at DPI, and also working in a company for their course. And then uh, we have uh, tech leadership programs that are getting established. You know, so I don't have any numbers for that, and workforce development programs. Uh, so that involve upskilling and reskilling. So one of the things we offered at the beginning of the pandemic was a pathway for up people from other sectors. So, um, and we have uh, high school to career pathways, so there is a program that builds out career pathways for individuals, and a lifelong learning platform that allows people to learn these skills. So this is a very high level summary of the workforce development program, and I'm not going to talk about it more, uh, but we have a very uh, large uh, program that is addressing every, everyone of the skills that are required. Um, and then, this is the part lead at DPI. Uh, so we fund R&D to foster a pipeline of next generation uh, technologies and new businesses. And so our focus has been in these eight sectors. Uh, and these are sectors that are strategic to Illinois, uh, where 36 of the Fortune 500 companies are uh, located. And, uh, and so our goal is to take teams of faculty, just like the teams that we saw today, earlier today, uh, and take them from where they are in the research lab and make them into actual knowledge workers. So we are building a pipeline, you know, where we are systematizing this process, saying these are the things that you have to do in the first phase, in the second phase you do this, in the third phase you do this, and we, we, we have, you know, activities and programs planned at each stage. So for instance, in phase one, it's very likely that, you know, the teams will need additional research we give them some funding, like we give them $125,000 to about $150,000. Uh, but then, you know, they will need more funding. That's not usually enough. And so we um, we actually help them, you know, acquire more funding by collaborating with them, uh, writing proposals, and, and helping them uh, connect into various funding opportunities. Right? And and then we then do this phase two between phase one and phase two. There is workshop where we bring academic, industry, and government partners together. So, um, and uh, this is meant to actually understand, you know, the, the needs of various stakeholders in the ecosystem and sharpen the business focus and plan. And phase two is then about, uh, you know, business strategies, you know, and then entrepreneurial training for the faculty and postdocs that are involved, and building a minimum viable product, right? So, uh, and then there are, you know, Things like launching an alpha, launching a beta, writing small business grants, you know, and then uh, connecting them to larger venture capitalists and everything else. And so that's kind of roughly the pipeline, and we are implementing various stages of this pipeline. Uh, and I will talk about a few success stories uh, in the next few slides. Uh, so these were the teams that we funded in 2020. Um, as you can see, they are quite a wide spread. So uh, I'll highlight some of the healthcare ones. I think is uh, a team led by a professor called Jeff Lowe, who is building one of the very large data sets on uh, the human brain. 
and he has already launched two companies, Hybrid Analytics and Hybrid Therapeutics, that, and he's working with the EPI of these two companies. Uh, there is a team that is doing kidney wellness, uh, so they are looking at managing, you know, chronic kidney conditions like uh, chronic kidney disease. To uh, some of you may not know that the, the kidney disease actually takes up one percent of the federal government budget uh, in the U.S. because the patients that are on dialysis in uh, in Medicare that are uh, sponsored by Medicare, uh, they you know they end up being one percent of the expense in the U.S. federal government budget. So in some ways. If there are, um, if these people are developing uh, management strategies for managing those conditions using uh, augmented reality, virtual reality situations. So, if for instance they are developing meditation you know, apps that are uh, allowing patients to manage their condition while they are doing the dialysis, so things like that. So they are building what is called a kidney wellness institute um, and working with many industrial partners. Um, um, so this is an additional set of teams that we founded in 2021. So we run this yearly competition where uh, we invite proposals from uh, University of Illinois system and its partners and, uh, and then faculty submit proposals and then it's a very competitive process and we uh, fund a few teams every year uh, between 10 and 12 uh, and we receive about 40 to 50 applications. Um, and so one of the biggest success stories is uh, an application where we were uh, a team that was looking for COVID in the wastewater. You know, this team has gone from a small seed grant of 125,000 to a very uh, series of grants that have brought in about 70 million in research funding. And uh, we are now probably serving the dashboard for the whole state of Illinois and also for the city of Chicago. So we are sampling the wastewater and looking for the presence of COVID. Uh, as you know, it shows up in the wastewater a few days before it actually shows up in real uh, saliva or uh, test. So I think that's um, uh, this team is doing that and they are sampling all the 100 counties in Illinois uh, for uh, this research work. Um, so here is a team that's monitoring bridges for cracks and crevices using drones. I won't talk about all that, but these are all very exciting technologies that are at various stages of deployment. Here is a team that's building out a, a, a digital twin of the city of Chicago uh, so that they can place, uh, you know, battery charging stations. Uh, this is a team that's solving the last mile problem for the U.S. I think in India it's more common, uh, but in the U.S. this combined multimodal transit of ride sharing and public transport is yet to kind of uh, reach its peak. So uh, this team is working with Uber uh, to design uh, a last mile policies for the city of Chicago and also the villages that we found. Uh, so DPI is good. These, these teams are not just the teams from the University of Illinois system. They, they are from all of the DPI's partners, as you can see in this slide. Uh, and, uh, and, and we are growing, right? We are looking at partnerships in Singapore, in Mexico. Thank you for being great partners. Uh, I think uh, I think you were the first partner for DPI, I think. So we are very proud of that. So um, I think you know the goal of the partners uh, program is multi-fold, right? We want to establish multi-country research teams, faculty, scientists, people exchanging, collaborating, right? Uh, and you know, pursuing research funding from international agencies. So if you are writing proposals to the you know, Indian Council for Medical Research or, uh, you know, or for one of the defense you know, programs, we can provide support letters. Likewise, uh, if there are pilot projects to be done in India, uh, teams that are here can help. So there are multiple ways of collaborating and we do that with you know, many of our partners. Um, and uh, you know, we also partners help us validate the global relevance of research that is conducted at DPI. Uh, and we want to also host uh, centers at DPI from our international partners. And I'll talk about our broader plans on that. Right? Uh, and we want to attract startups from India to Chicago. You know, 
very much on the part and we want to develop other education on this side. So uh, I will talk briefly talk about the ventures. Uh, these are this is the business building activity of DPI starting from university research. And the main uh, success story there is this company called Shield TC, which is uh, which took a saliva test that was developed out of the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign and made it into a, a business by putting the testing lab on mobile truck and have you know have those trucks be brought out of the US and some in New Zealand and those right. And this company has run more than 8 million saliva tests to date and has made more than 100 million dollars and has given back a considerable amount to the university. And uh, now together with DPI, this company Shield TC is running this call for proposals, uh, inviting you know similar ideas and giving funding from um, so the last thing I want to talk about is the actual site where DPI is. We currently are operating out of Chicago downtown from a lease facility, but we will soon have our own facility in downtown, uh, right by right next to the Chicago River. The state of Illinois and the city of Chicago have donated us a piece of land, and we have um, the right to first refusal for all the uh, adjoining plots in that land. So we can build as many buildings as uh, one is allowed, right? Uh, and this will be the main innovation ecosystem. We want to invite all our like-minded partners there, all our international partners there to set that shop so that uh, we can work together from multiple points of view uh, and, uh, and, and to translate all our ideas to actual economics. Uh, and uh, there is a second building that is being planned by uh, the developer of that site. Uh, this will house mostly bio innovation and uh, you know, and so this is one place where if your leadership can think about uh, setting up some uh, facility right in your own house. So I want to just, you know, so far I have mostly won my leadership hat as the director of uh, research at DPI. I want to go back and wear my scientific hat just for a brief bit and sort of provide some high level remarks about how we can do AI driven healthcare innovation, what are the key challenges, problems, and kind of summarize things there. So, how much time do we have? So, I'll, I'll wrap this up part quickly so we can have some time for the questions. So, I think the US healthcare is a case of very misaligned incentives. The patients have no incentive to seek the, the lowest cost care. Right? And here, uh, probably you are aware how much an x-ray costs in you know, this school, in, in maybe Apollo hospitals, and maybe the, the x-ray center down the street from you. And uh, you know people make those choices. In the US, they go to the nearest facility, whether it is uh, one of the premium hospitals or whether it is a you know, emergency clinic. Right? So I think practically there is no uh, difference it makes to actual, you know, uh, costs, right? So, and, and providers have no incentive to seek cost-effective treatment strategies or methodologies. The practice is often defensive, right? And uh, incentivized to follow some playbooks and uh, and payers like Medicare and insurance companies have no big incentive to cover preventive treatments, right? And so what they end up doing is to continue to bundle catastrophic care services with routine ones, right? And the whole system is about this bundling, and therefore, you know, people end up paying more than what they should, right? So, I think the, the, the bigger thinking we want to introduce here is to introduce greater transparency in the system to identify speed spots and align incentives. So, that can be done by collecting data from a very macroscopic level to all the minutiae and details so that we can have a platform that would inform us of the key insights of where the costs are and how we can factor them. So uh, I think the other thing is that there is this big payer provider data gap that allows uh, for lesser innovation. So providers often don't see a very integrated view of uh, patient data. You know, uh, so Prop tells me that uh, the radiology department doesn't see the same set of things that the surgery department 
disease and therefore this whole integrated view of how to handle the patient's condition is sort of missing across agencies. And uh, there is operational data is not good either, right? You know, operational data right from the time a patient falls into a hospital to um, actually uh, the discharge, right? You know, uh, where the time is spent, you know, what is the queuing of the various operations? How can it be made, be made more efficient? So all that. So I think a comprehensive view of both patient care as well as operations is kind of missing on the provider side. On the payer side, there is a lot of data. Every time there is a method or a treatment that is um, provided, the payer is built. So the payer gets to see a very comprehensive view of what happens to a patient. But the payer, by law, cannot act on that, and therefore the patient doesn't get, even though there is one source of data that exists that can provide inform a lot of things about care for the patient that cannot be acted upon and therefore this, since this gap exists, patients are not getting the best of things, right? So I think what we are trying to do is to create this view of, of what exists at the, at the payer on the provider side and that's one of the uh, main innovations in this engine proposal. And uh, so basically, the idea is to collect data at a massive scale, uh, both operational data as well as clinical data. And we built this platform called EHP3. It's an equitable health platform for payers, patients, and providers. Uh, and it has four goals access, improved access, uh, patient care, you know, informed by all the data, uh, population health, you know, uh, including social. And then policy thing. And uh, we want to extensively use AI and machine learning in this, uh, but I think privacy and security would be the sort of you know, keystone in, in, in this whole solution. And uh, we want to provide all the benefits of these analytics to improve uh, patient outcomes, uh, to reduce costs. And, and so uh, there is a whole uh, bunch of things that are value proposition for this kind of a platform, both in the short term and the long term. Um, I wouldn't go into reading out this list, but I think that you know having uh, you know having a view of the patient's health, a 360 degree view of the patient's health, uh, allows providers to offer better treatment you know methodologies, uh, and uh, you know and payers can uh, you know can can, 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 can there could be improved costing in payers. The implementation of you know, health plans, they can offer more fine grain insurance plans, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of you know benefits to um, building such a platform, uh, and uh, I think the the main technical innovation in such a platform would be how we can use AI responsibly, right? And so uh, we have done a lot of work uh, in the past few years on uh, building trustworthy AI solutions, uh, where we, uh, the, 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 the whole notion of AI being robust, right, with, with privacy, fairness, and interoperability. So right now, AI is just a black box where it gives, provides some uh, predictive outcomes when you give it some input. But what we want to do is to open it up and make it more transparent and interpretable. That means that uh, the AI is not only saying, you know, this is the answer, but it's also saying how we'll arrive at that. So uh, a physician can actually uh, walk through his reasoning and, 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 and ensure and attest that it is good for him. Right? So uh, this is, of course, one of the biggest challenges for AI, and we've made considerable progress uh, using the reserve science team at DPI that is fully devoted to uh, trustworthy AI. And, uh, and they are producing these explainable and auditable models And, uh, and we have a very big cyber infrastructure, one of the very best in the country, in the US, in the world. Uh, we have two, one national lab and one very large center in Argonne National Lab. Argonne National Lab, just in the suburbs of Chicago, has a system called Aurora, which is one of the fastest supercomputers in, uh, in the world. And then uh, a supercomputing system at uh, Urbana Champaign has been a leader for the last you know, decade. And so we will basically break the combined power of all these BTPIs that are meeting our organization 
Argon is our partner. In fact, we did a follow proposal to Argon a couple of months back, inviting proposals to join these great API uh, partners in Argon research station. And now uh, we will leverage the power of these two systems to do large scale analytics that is necessary for this task. So we have all the kind of groundwork, the hardware, uh, the system environment ready, and the investments being made by DPI uh, towards building this out. Uh, so, uh, and it's, it's among, the, among the very best academic systems you can leverage. And so I think, you know, I'll just stop there. Uh, these are our, you know, high level thoughts, plans about how we'll go about building that engine. And I uh, want to thank uh, my collaborators. Uh, uh, these are uh, faculty from both UIC and UIUC, and Rob is uh, our guiding light. And uh, all of the DPI staff members have contributed to building this engine. And uh, so thanks to them. And uh, DPI is broadly committed to ensuring that the next generation of talent is ready to work on our projects. And I would encourage you all to join uh, DPI's activities. Thank you, uh, Professor Lecter, for the shake. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Dilu Pradhakar now to the bio and uh, moderate the uh, session. So, uh, Venkat, what can I say? That was a terrific overview. I know for uh, those of you who are newly in, in the health field, uh, it might have sounded a little uh, engineering. Uh, so, let me just you know, simplify if I may. So, at the end of the day, what is it that we are trying to do? At the end of the day, we are trying to deliver healthcare to an individual who needs healthcare in the most cost effective way and in a most timely manner and with no time to lock down. Correct? That is at the end of the day, the purpose of any health service. Correct? So if that is the you know, purpose, you know, then how do we then, I mean, we clearly articulate it. We have a lot of patient data, and the doctors, you know, are the, the part of the healthcare system. They look at the chart items on a particular situation, or I look at the different situation, symptomatic and all of that. And then you have, you know, healthcare systems, uh, that is simply you know, providing uh, real estate for patients to come and see and get treated and go. And they have their own you know, challenges and financial models. And then the insurance companies, and then of course the policy makers. So, how do we then integrate all of these things so that as a patient, the nurse or the doctor gets the timely treatment he needs in the most time? Correct? Otherwise, otherwise, the society is not going to you know, it's going to go backwards. No country, including America, can continue to spend 20% of their GDP on health. It is just simply an untenable model. And so, therefore, you know, everybody's interest to understand how we can use technologies to you know, get this done. But I'll just give you two examples. One, we have particular challenges in urban areas. For example, in American cities, it's really, really very bad. Uh, you have incredibly poor people living in one part, one corner of the city. And now the well-to-do people living in other parts of the city. So there's tremendous healthcare disparity. Tremendous healthcare disparity that you cannot even fathom. And we in Chicago, believe it or not, a patient who lives only 15 miles from my medical center in the middle of Chicago winter may have to catch three buses to come to me. And the doctors are, you know, not blaming anybody. The systems are like that. So the patient walks in and the diagnosed as very severe diabetes. Which has not been able to turn on because of the diagnosis. So let's say it's a Now, this patient has already developed a good clinic of managing some patients. So, when they come to the endocrinology clinic, they look at the blood sugar and they are given a medication, and then they are told, no, you are better, you, know, you better get a, get a checkup with a neurologist or an ophthalmologist, and so on. Because the brain is fabulous. Now, just think of this patient having to catch three births in the middle of Chicago winter go back to their home. And neurology says, I my calendar is booked and you know two weeks from now, please come back. 
Now this poor person has to catch three buses, in the middle of winter, come back and sit around in the hospital for two, three, four hours so the neurologist can do general examination, write one more prescription and go back. And then all of a sudden, you know, this point in the reference, you know, maybe you know, well, better get your eyes tested. So I want you to know this happens in a very compulsory devices. We don't give a damn for this patient, so to speak. I mean, if you really gave a damn to this patient, I will not make this sick person catch three buses in the middle of Chicago five times just to get the best of information that we have. This is the reality. And I want you to know this is reality in Bangalore today. So it's not that some from Chicago. Only difference between Chicago and here is Bangalore weather is more you know, convenient and you know, they can afford to take the bus without freezing. This is one type of problem. The other set of problem in a country like uh, Chicago, I mean, uh, United States, is so big, so big. People live in rural areas. I mean, this is a reasonably well to do middle class people. But they have an entirely different set of problems. The nearest drugstore is 35 miles. Now there are two elderly couples living in a house in the middle of a car and field. Just think of this. And they're 80 years old, 85 years old. Their eyesight has failed. So their the driver's license has been taken away. And the drug store is 35 miles from the house. Just think of the challenges these people have. Just think of the problem of these people. And this is to get a prescription. Nobody gives them a prescription for six months or 12 months. They give a prescription for three months or many days. Or they give a prescription for 30 days. So they have to deal with this happy problem that's completely human force to be, you know, to just get medication. And now one of the two couples die. And the other person, you know, is debilitated and cannot drive. Now think of this person's challenge. So the healthcare disparities, healthcare disparities, whether you're in urban area, it's completely one set of problem. If you're in rural area, it's one set of problem. Earlier, you know, in one of the comments that I made, I fell off the bicycle and I broke my left tibia. I had to wait until the following morning until we were able to organize a car and I had to drive 45 miles to King Road to get a car. Okay. So we are, uh, this is you know, this is when I was 55 years ago, right? So and we are facing similar challenges in 2022 with all the technology. So therefore, therefore, the healthcare reform has to happen. It has to happen now, and we have to take advantage of technologies. We have to take advantage of video conferencing. We have to take advantage of you know uh, remote uh, you know maritime applications and so on. Number one. Number two. The most important thing is we, as doctors, as future doctors, really have to think of our, our, our job in a patient-centric manner, not from a healthcare system-centric manner, which is unfortunately what is happening today. You know, every policy, every decision that's made about, oh, we have UI. And UI has a bunch of people sitting in the C-suite, and they sit around and they say, what is the bottom line, what is this, what is revenue, what is the income, this and that, and whatnot, and they make up some policy. Nobody in the decision-making process is really thinking about an individual patient. What the hell are we doing to improve their access to healthcare? So one is access to healthcare. When we talk about access to healthcare, we talk about a BPL card, that card, this card, that one level of access to healthcare. But I told you about the physical access to healthcare. And once they do come to the you know, facilities, are we providing equitable healthcare? So these are profoundly important human values that they have to cherish. And so therefore, how do we do that? And I want you to know what Venkat has presented. It is not some technological, you know, you know razzmatazz that we are trying to do. We are very serious about addressing these very fundamental problems in a way that individual person can actually benefit. And, 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 and you can see a very complex, uh, multidimensional, you know, uh, innovative solution that we are trying to create because everybody is worrying about patient, is worrying about you know, their insurance policy pays premium, the doctors are worried about how much they get paid, and how many hours do I work, and for how many procedures to, how many other things do I have to run around in a day, and the healthcare systems are talking about filling the bag, or what is the footfall, what is the operation load, and on and on and on. And then, of course, the insurance companies are worried about how do I not pay, the, you know, how do I not, you know, the paper the coverage that they already have, or how do I reduce the cost. So everybody, is actually doing the right thing if you think of their own interests. Nobody is trying to do anything harmful to anybody. Everybody is trying to do their own efficiency. But however, collectively, collectively, it has led to inefficient pharmacy. 
connected, you know, inaccessibility, and so on and so forth. So the beauty of what the effect has presented, you know, because he's an engineer, so he presented it from an engineering point of view, and of course, you know, I'm going to convert him to a health expert in the next six months, because he's very interested. So I wanted to impress upon you, what is it that we are trying to do, and why is it so fundamentally important? I hope, I hope, uh, between two of us, we have conveyed the technical promise that we are bringing to address this incredibly complex human problem, and also what is the purpose of you know, our work and also effort is at the end of the day to provide equitable health care to everyone. That's at least our aspiration. Whether we will succeed or not, only time will tell. I think we will succeed because there are many, many, many people. It's not only record that I think about this. There are tens of thousands of people in America because they're fed up of this. Fed up of this system that we have. In spite of all the money we spend, mm -hmm. outcomes are awful. So why is it? So therefore, I want all of you to be thinking about it because unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon which aspect you look, India is pretty much mimicking the American healthcare system, which is completely mind-boggling to me. Completely mind-boggling to me. And, 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 and everybody is, you know, impressed with that scan, this scan, whether you need it or not, and na, 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 on one level. And in another level, I see people standing in line at 6 a.m. in the morning, so they can around the hour of the two of the people. I mean, I see these extremes. You know, people getting scans that they don't need, and people who need everything getting, you know, the Canada they call it Tiger, you know, <laughs> in the morning, six o'clock, in front of a petting shop. I mean, it is completely mind boggling to me. Uh, so please, you know, please all of you give some serious thought as to what is it that we are trying to do, why are we trying to do it, are we trying, are we doing it in an equitable manner, and it is, you know, properly priced. That's fair so that people can afford it. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, and uh, between me and Venkat, we'll try to answer whatever questions people may have. And, and it is absolutely essential you all ask us questions. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be a one way conversation. And it's going to be the way. Anybody who is a brave person, please do it, sir. Yeah, you know, the intent was not rather to list Amaya Medical College per se. It was actually meant to be the uh, yeah, you know, Amaya family. But that logo was beautiful and they were, they were part of our Heartless to India program already. So we have done that. So don't pay too much attention to what logo is there. If you have an idea and if you want to work with us, please reach out and believe me, do not discriminate people from RIT or the Medical College. <laughs> you, you can be rest assured. I mean, your school is one of the most well scientific schools in the U.S. in terms of planning. Very good. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, it was a nice talk. I have to sit in the audience for some time. Uh, as you said, uh, as the technology is developed, uh, more learning than 
and uh, still we are lacking to connect the people for the rural like rural or urban. But uh, what is that it is hindering with respect to connectivity because the information is very much heavy and we could be able to develop a lot of computing, mobile computing and also lost a lot of embedded and sensing systems across the world. And still, because I'm just having a skeptical question in my mind, then that why we are not able to bring in that kind of a usual procedures of the human nature that we millions of years before in the data. Now the technology is improved. And we could able to intricately look at individual health through the technology. Why is the connectivity is not happening? Is that uh, just a my thought process? Is that the business that is business model is still coming to picture? Or it, it, it's not happening because of some other hindrances happening? Because everything is digitization and we could able to connect anywhere across the world, whatever the multimodal systems, audio, video, text, everything is connected, everything is cloud. Based and individualistic, we could able to discriminate. What is that last mile which is not happening? Is my concern every time because I do many of the projects uh, collaborative medical science. I look at uh, your expertise. If I have, I could able to do a lot of connectivity with any kind of patient, doctor, or pharmaceutical, any kind of concern, whatever it is. It can be disseminated without any hindrance except the expertise of the medical doctor. That we may not be understanding because we are not medical doctors. Only that decision making and the, the AI, whatever we talk, we could be able to predict, we could be able to develop a lot of expert system. Why it is not happening still is a question which the Dale Prabhu can also explain through a little some example we gave and all those things. What is that hindrance is still in the blind spot? I'm just wondering. So actually there is a very significant uh, segment of the population that doesn't have access to these basic things. You know, in Illinois, the state where we are, a lot of people like broadband connectivity. You know, a lot of people. And uh, there are programs that the university is running now to actually improve access to broadband, but uh, still, uh, that's called the digital divide. So we can talk about all this technology, but there is a separate outreach effort that needs to be done to ensure that people are connected into this. Right? And that is very much part of the solution. It's not, so right now it's not there. We, we have not connected everybody into the digital you know, uh, ecosystem. So that is work that needs to be done. But it's not just that. I think costs are another thing. Like you know, uh, if you, you want to provide uh, wearable devices to people to track their, you know, health. You know, this, these things are expensive, right? So costs have come down dramatically, but they are still expensive. Right? So, uh, and then on top of it, all the you know data collection, monitoring systems. So in some ways, being able to have an economic ecosystem that is able to drive the cost down so that these become commodity things so that we can innovate on top of that. That's a very important thing. And uh, until we bring all the stakeholders together to achieve that level of scale and impact, all these things will remain inaccessible to a large extent. So there are a few sources of unless human race accepts Healthcare is a fundamental human right, right? So we're going to be continuing to have this divide, and, and this is a, this is really a, 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 a struggle for so, a part of the social justice struggle that's going to happen all around the world. It's already started in many countries, and in America, just before every election, this is one of the major topics about health insurance, who's going to pay what, and you know, what Medicare should be expanded, whether that should be universal health. This is a debate that is going on and on and on. And, and so therefore, therefore, uh, there's a very serious thought, you know, very serious analysis that's being done uh, to really you know, look at the universal health. 
there is little or no doubt that Medicare, for example, negotiates the lowest price possible for anything and everything that has to do with health, whether it's outpatient, inpatient, doctor's fee, specialist fee, image, etc. Medicare pays the lowest amount possible. So it has clearly proven beyond any reasonable doubt, and Medicare covers over 60 million people, that this Medicare, Medicare health system controlled by the central government, the federal government in America, has become the most satisfied, most cost, cost effective insurance system. So a lot of people are arguing why don't we make it a universal health policy and use Medicare as a standard. But there are so many insurance companies that are incredibly rich, incredibly powerful, and they contribute hundreds of millions of dollars in every election cycle to the politicians who are in the business of making policy. Okay? I'm not criticizing it, I'm just stating the idea. And therefore, what I call vested interest happens. Okay? So if you have a lab where down the street, you know, you will, as, a, as an individual lab owner, your only purpose, your only purpose is to scan as many human beings as possible in eight hours or ten hours. You are willing to extend the hours to twelve hours if the business is good. So as an individual, you are just providing scanning without any consideration whatsoever whether the patient needs to come out and what the right? From your business point of view, this guy is doing the best thing. Everybody will celebrate this as a great, great businessman having a good lab. But in the process, this is what has happened. And this is being done in a compartmentalized manner at every stage. That's what I was trying to you know, allude when we were talking. And, and the patients are almost powerless. If I'm sick, I come to one hospital, you know, if I'm acutely you know, ill, where do I have the opportunity to go shop around in eight different places? I go to the first emergency room and I pay whatever the heck they ask me to pay, correct? But if I have an option, you know, if I have an elective surgery, then I have the ability to go and shop and, you know, and take my sweet time. So all of these things are playing out. Honestly, all of these things are playing out. And therefore, it's very hard to pin the blame on any one particular aspect of this healthcare system. Okay? That is, that is. So that is why a lot of people are now beginning to. I will give you a very good example of what is happening in our university of Illinois. My wife is the uh, clinical practice director for psychiatry. Okay? So what happened during COVID-19? The doctors were very happy. The patients were very happy. Everything was happening in telemedicine. It was amazing. It was counseling, and the patients were very comfortable. You know, the telecounseling. And, and then what happened was the insurance companies will pay you, you know, 30% of what uh, what they would pay otherwise because there is a huge amount for facility charge. Yeah? So therefore, in our own hospital, I'm going to tell you, we rather see the patient in a facility because I can build the facility charges also. So as a, as a healthcare management person, you know, I'm generating revenue for my hospital. There is nothing inherently wrong in what I'm doing. But in the process, the patient is not you know, feeling the pain because the insurance company is paying. Okay? The patient is not feeling the pain because they think it's coming free because the insurance is paying. But the forget, the next year their premium is going to go up. See, this is the, this is the disconnect that I've seen. And, and believe it or not, this is really still going on in our university. Uh, so then the physicians and the hospital management said, no, 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 you guys, physicians, you gotta come back to work. You know, you signed up to work in a healthcare system, you signed up to you went to become a doctor, or you you have signed up to work in a hospital, and we have enough uh, safety precautions, you come to work in person. Why? Why were they insisting you come to work in person? Because the patient can be seen in facility so that they came to see me in session instead of thirty two dollars, you're gonna be three hundred dollars. See, this is how the whole system is like this. And now the patient is unhappy because for a 15 minute session, I have to take three buses to come to my chamber. I'm waiting in the waiting room for an hour. And then there's a 15 minute counseling session, and they, you know, then they take three buses to go home. So they have to take a whole day off for a 15 minute counseling session. You know, for the counseling. So just think of this. You think I don't know how to do it in 20 minutes? Of course I do. But I cannot. Because the system is telling to bring the patient here. So, so where do we, where do we, you know, where do we draw the line? Who, I'm, I'm giving you a very personal example. I told you, my wife is struggling with this even today, although the COVID is pretty much disappeared. And that's all practical for her. So, so the whole system has been incentivized to make it expensive. It's a, that's a very bizarre, you know, of all the services that you've covered is the one system which 
So therefore, therefore innovation becomes integrated, you know. So therefore, the system itself has to accept before they give the doctors control. Because they cannot do it at any the level. They have to wait for the professional society to develop those guidelines and make those guidelines approved so that, you know, the insurance companies accept, the federal policy guys accept it as well. This is in healthy, it's very, very complex. Sorry, sir, that's about the other question. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank
towards healthcare, I think healthcare is still uh, relatively niche. But you know, if we talk about the general labor market, I think you know the threats are even a lot more because there are healthcare is very specialized. Right? So I think in some ways, uh, and it's a very tightly regulated. And, and I think the, the the permeation of technology to replace or you know threaten um, the basic functions is still not. So 
So I am uh, look. This is a new brave world, and if you lose uh, this job, and then get another job, you will be at because you know, somebody has to be doing all of this in the IT, right? So therefore, all the stenographers lost their job, but but it created you know 10 million other jobs in you know, the pharma, which is the banking and computer, or maybe computer developing software. So I I I won't worry about it. Human and human beings are incredibly crazy, and so we need to be very optimistic. You know. My consolation is that my age, I don't think I'm afraid of losing my job. You know, analyze, analyze of how it is. Any, any, if there are no other questions, you know, it's already late. Uh, one second, just, just to want to make sure that, uh, the, you know, okay, please go ahead. We'll make it the last question. Training of our doctor, uh, we've seen how uh, the training is changing. Like, we were used uh, to, I mean, we were trained the classical systems of things like percussion, percussion. Yeah. Now, with the advent of all these digital devices, uh, are we going to have uh, a different kind of training and are the new generation of doctors going to miss the classical training that uh, we receive? Uh, will there be a change and how it's going to change the uh, entire education system? Yeah, yeah, we have changed on that. Digital, we, we started a brand new AI ML center uh, in our college of medicine. And one of the main purposes of that is to address healthcare, which is healthcare and work very closely with DPI. Because when cuts operation is going to focus on machine learning based studies, and we are going to be in a position of some scientists who are going to tap into that, right? Number one. And the second aspect is how do we incorporate many of these things into our medical school curriculum? Because by the time our first year medical student goes into the real world practice, we are talking about medical techniques from this, right? And therefore, yeah, yeah, machine learning will be a reality for those people. So we are now already building that into our medical school curriculum in the beginning of this course. Right? And then we are actually conducting workshops for our residents and fellows because they are already in the practice in the future. So these are these are the this is the beauty. I mean, do I do I cry about not having a black or rotary dial phone? The answer is no. Right. 
if you actually shot it, you are not succeeding in anything. Just force your mind. If you are not concentrated, that is the problem. Okay, so learning this technology is not an issue. Idea is that how to use the technology yes, to solve a massive problem, not to the mind. No, I agree with you. That's why I gave the most simplest of example, mice. Right? If you can do so many things with it, wonderful things with it, but you cannot sustain it. So I think it's all, you know, you know who has the tool in their hand? I mean, this gentleman, me, which are not, he is in generally internationally renowned as a cyber specialist. Yes. That's what penetrates, you know, over the years. Uh, so look at what is happening. In, you know, why is he an expert in cyber security? Because there are people, you know, who want to help us. People want to steal money from our bank. Right? <laughs> so, so that part, there are people like Venkat who will say, no, you can't do that. Guys, you know, you must do other things. And there is some people saying, yes, I'm doing these things. And how many of us have bank accounts? How many, how many of, uh, of us have been cheated? But we believe about that as if it is happening to every human being every single day, every moment. That's how the newspapers project it. I'm not, un I'm not under underestimating the challenges. I'm not underestimating the, the corrupt mind some of these people have. But by and large, by and large, you know, accounts are safe or many things in good place. Nobody has taken that away. So I think that I look at it. I look at the broader implications of what we do instead of worrying about the exception. Yeah. 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 When Prague uh, answered some terminologies such as this type of impact, client centricity, patient centricity, or music technology. And looking at the scale and the complexity, if there is one way that we can solve, technology has two options. That's where I relate uh, Mr. Venkat's uh, talk uh, to be able to use the artificial intelligence rightfully, I think, as many of our uh, audience members mentioned there is an ethical right to use the artificial intelligence. I'm sure DPA has that very much uh, uh, within their uh, focus area as DPA promotes these uh, new ideas and invite faculty, students to be able to explore uh, these uh, digital health innovations. I'm sure this will certainly be at the back uh, of their uh, over planning for this. So, so I should admit, I think the kind of challenge that DPA is trying to address today, I think uh, you know, it was economic, uh, in terms of cost 
zero to be including tax free. And particularly with the focus on providers of education, I would say it's, I, I think it's fabulous. And uh, if your talk was very informative and very inspirational, I probably, I would really pay attention to the name of a tax because it's a very good idea. And listening to such uh, input from you, I think you already had a great start with the Amazon ecosystem. And I'm sure you are with it here. Uh, to be able to share the vision of DPI and inspire more and more of us to participate in the great journey that DPI has taken under your leadership. I'm sure you won't, uh, 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 you will uh, feel that this visit will pull out in the near future. And Prabh, dear friend, and an eighth day, and however uh, dynamic, you will you take, uh, give the best to the UIC, best to this country, this uh, institution. And, and I'm sure of you and the UIC team and in all of us here will collaborate <laughs> very well, very effectively, very efficiently to really accomplish the vision of the Institute of Thank you. Thank you so much for coming over and spending this time and both of us for giving feedback to our faculty in the first session and this excellent uh, informative talk. Thank you so much. Father, well, thank you. But moderation and especially emphasizing for TNU. And also because I know you can connect with folks uh, because you visited us so often. That kind of does help to translate uh, complexity into a simple understanding that we all need to have. Thanks for summarizing and moderating and simplifying. And uh, Dr. Medharam and Dr. Shalini, I think you and your team, I think, offered, hosted this uh, session. And I know a lot of others from the background work and just to make this uh, happen in a very quick time because it was planned tomorrow, it was advanced. But yet, I think we were able to pull it out uh, very well. And again, at the end, thanks to all of the faculty members and new students and doctors. That to be, uh, I'm sure they had their 